are some of the worst mistakes people make with their investments? Well, here to talk with me about this is Dana Anspa from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Hi, Bob. So I'm eager to learn about the mistakes that people make with their investments and perhaps even some of the, what, catastrophic mistakes they make. Yeah, you know, we could look at different investing mistakes and categories, mistakes where you lose a little bit of money and you're kind of like, oh, why did I do that? And then catastrophic mistakes that wipe you out, like literally you are starting from zero. And I could also break the mistakes into mistakes I've seen clients make and mistakes I've made myself. <laughs> so I thought where we'd start, um, you know, is some of the things I've seen clients do and particularly two catastrophic mistakes I saw that just, you know, it really breaks my heart. Um, the first was, you know, she was a, a widow with four children and remarried and had a, a large portfolio over $4 million. And, you know, as she remarried, they were uh, of a particular religious affiliation. And they had been a client I had worked with for a few years. And they decided they wanted to go to a firm that did everything, estate planning, tax, and was and investments, and was of the same religious affiliation as they were. And so they did and, and sent a very nice letter, you know, you've been wonderful, but here's what we're doing. And about two years later, I heard back from them, and they wanted to come in and ask me to see what happened to their money. So they brought in a stack of documents and I literally remember turning like white as a ghost as I was reading through it. So they had signed two promissory notes and lent the money to basically a private real estate deal, but with, you know, no official private placement paperwork, you know, just I, you sign a promissory note and go, here's $2 million and here's my other $2 million. And the note was paying 12%. And so they got a few interest checks and then nothing more. And, you know, they would reach out and the, and the advisor would tell them, well, the project was encountering these difficulties or that difficulties. And after getting put off for long enough is when they came back and asked me to look through the paperwork. I sent them to an attorney and, you know, unfortunately, that money was gone. So it was their entire life savings, all, all four million. That is, in my career of now over 25 years, the worst what I would call catastrophic mistake that I've seen. And um, it, it could have been avoided. Yeah. That's, that's the challenge. Um, when I think about, you know, those private, private investments, you know, us as financial advisors, we have a set of rules we would need to follow when investing your money. And so if somebody wanted to put a portion of their money in a, in a private investment, we might say, well, the maximum you should do is 10%. I could get sued if I put 100% of a client's money in an investment like that. But as a client, you can do whatever you want, right? You can, you know, you can decide to, to take that kind of risk. So, you know, it was very opaque. They didn't understand. They trusted the person. I think they allowed their emotions in terms of that a religious affiliation kind of say, oh, you know, of course we trust them. And they signed over $4 million and it was all gone. Yeah. So when you think about the principles that were violated here, I guess a couple come to mind for me that this notion of the prudent man rule is at play. The principles of diversification are at play and and perhaps the principles of investing only in in uh, in what you know and doing the required due diligence to, to, before you invest is required here. Yeah, I think it's easy with friends um, or people that we trust to not go through a formal due diligence process and think, oh, you know, well, I believe them. I mean, I, I've made this mistake myself, which I'll talk about. You know, of course, you know, they've done all of the work, and so you know, this this will turn out fine. And I don't think there's anything wrong. We, you know, we all like to take a flyer. I'll call it uh, with, on our on some of our money, but if you do that with all of your money, not understanding that risk return trade off, so you can earn twelve percent on this money, or lose it all. Like yeah. that's not a good risk return trade off. You might say, okay, well, if I stayed in a diversified portfolio over time, I'd likely earn six to seven percent. So. 
you know, if I think there's this investment that's going to pay double that, 12, how much of my portfolio should I allocate to that? Well, not 100%. <laughs> Definitely not 100%. So those are some of the, the, the rules of thumb or prudent way of, of looking at that that you could follow to avoid making that kind of catastrophic mistake or take it out of the catastrophic category into the, oh, you know, I lost some money, but it's not going to wipe me out. I'll recover. Right. I, I'm also reminded of Warren Buffett when he approaches investing. He also says, I'll invest in something where I can afford to lose 50% of my investment, but no more. And, uh, and, and of course, it seems like they violated that rule here, too. Yeah. You know, can you afford to lose 100% of this investment? And, you know, in their case, the answer was no. Like, that's it. You're starting from scratch. Yeah. 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 Any other client examples? Yeah, there is um, the, the second catastrophic situation I've seen. This was back in 2005, 2006. So I, you know, had a business partner at the time, you know, before I had started Sensible Money. And he had taken a look at this private real estate investment. Uh, it was a company in town in Scottsdale and Phoenix called Mortgages Limited, and it actually, when it all went bad, it made the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And so, you know, it, but it's a company had been in business for 45 years. It had never lost a dollar of client money. So we did all of our due diligence, as many other sophisticated investors did. And we had pooled client money, went to our more sophisticated clients and said, you know, there's this opportunity to invest in this. And, and it, it, you know, here's the return it's paid historically. And but we we did a prudent amount of their portfolio, no more than generally 10 percent of a client's portfolio. And then when the real estate market crashed in 2007, Mortgages Limited ended up filing bankruptcy. All of the private loans in the portfolio went under. It is still in recovery mode. So, you know, what's that over a decade later, right? They're still working on, on recovering funds. Like I said, it made the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Well, none of the clients that we worked with got wiped out except one. One looked at this investment and said, this is so good, I want to put all my money in it. I, I don't like the stock market. I'm nervous about the stock market. And we said, we won't do that. Like, I, I, I won't. It's not prudent, right? Literally, I have to follow a set of rules as an advisor. I won't do it. So he pulled all his money from us and said, well, you know, I really have enjoyed working with you, but I want to do this. And he went directly to that company and put 100% of his money. He was of retirement age, um, somewhere between 60 and 65, uh, about ready to retire. And of course, when this went under, it, it wiped out. Now, People have recovered maybe 50 to 60 percent of their money, but it's taken over a decade to to get that portion back. So you're about ready to retire and your entire portfolio, you know, is suddenly frozen. It did trickle back out. But that is what I call another catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. What's the principle violated there or the lesson to be learned there? I think, you know, similar is to what we discussed before is following a diversification plan. So how much of your portfolio would it be prudent to put in an investment like this that is less liquid? You know, we can say anything we want about the stock market, but it's very liquid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know it's very volatile also, but if you don't have to liquidate the market when it's down and you have patience, and historically the market has always recovered, versus some of these what I call opaque investments, they have risks that it's very difficult to identify. And when the whole real estate market crashed and, and this whole you know company that had been in business for 45 years um, went under, in hindsight, there was fraud in, in play. There was some things that, you know, should have been known, but there was a lot of sophisticated people who did their due diligence and no one spotted it. Yeah. And so it was an opaque investment, not publicly traded. And so it can be very difficult to spot these types of, of risks or situations that, that could be going on. But even if you can't spot them, if you simply followed the rule and said, well, I wouldn't put more than 5 or 10% of my money in something that's not publicly traded and very transparent, then you would have avoided that type of catastrophic risk altogether. Yeah. 
I mentioned before this notion of not investing in things that you don't understand. As a general rule, would you recommend that folks to avoid mistakes, avoid investing in things that aren't um, publicly regulated by an SEC, for instance, as opposed to these opaque investments that uh, are private in nature? You know, I think you really <sighs> – I wouldn't necessarily say I'd avoid them altogether. For the average person, I would avoid them altogether. Um, I have invested in opaque investments myself. I've seen people make money in private placement type investments. But it can be very difficult, like I said, to see what's going on in that black box. And so I really think, you know, it's either something that you do as a strategy where you're spreading your money out across a lot of different types of these investments versus I'm going to put, you know, all my money in one, mm -hmm. it, you know, of the 25 years I've been in business, I've now seen two of these private and plus placement investments really pay off. One was, I believe, is now Loan Depot, but I think it was called iMortgages when it came out. And I had a client put like $25,000 in it, which was a very prudent amount relative to their portfolio size. And I think, you know, ended up getting almost half a million out of it. So that was, you know, excellent, but he did it right. Right. He was in the real estate mortgage industry. He understood that industry. He understood the risks. So we only put twenty five thousand dollars in. Yeah. And in those situations, I think it can be OK to put some money in. You just have to follow a prudent set of rules about how you do it. Right. Any other mistakes that clients or, or you have made that are worth noting? <laughs> Well, definitely I'll get into some that I made. Uh, the, <laughs> the other one I want to talk about uh, that I've seen a client do, and now luckily um, this client, uh, you know, put about $80,000 into a currency trading program and was, you know, about ready to retire, actually had just retired. And I remember because they called me up and said, Dana, you know, I won't need to take any of that money out of the portfolio. We had his main portfolio set up to start monthly distributions. And I was like, what? You know, what's going on? Well, I found this currency trading investment and it's paying me, I think it was four or $5,000 a month on an $80,000 investment. I remember my heart, just my stomach, that sinking feeling, because I know that's not possible. Yeah. It is not possible for an investment to pay out those kinds of returns. And yet he didn't know that wasn't possible. And within a few months, it was discovered to be a Ponzi scheme. And so he did get a few checks, but essentially that, that $80,000 was gone. But again, it was a very prudent amount that, that he did, so it didn't wipe out his portfolio. And so he was okay, still, you know, quite disappointed to lose $80,000 right, right when he retired. Um, so, you know, when I think about that, it, same situation as Bernie Madoff many years ago, is people not understanding what is possible, there are limits in investing. There are, you know, patterns that are realistic and patterns that aren't realistic. And if you believe that risk-free returns are possible, you can get sucked into some of those scams more easily versus if you have a set of what is actually realistic. And if something looks too good to be true, it is violating some fundamental principles here, and I should probably stay away. Yeah. Yeah. Other mistakes? Well, we'll talk about some of mine. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was a, s a relatively small mistake in hindsight, but I was in my mid-30s, and uh, generally I do with my money what I tell our clients to do. I use diversified portfolio of index funds. I, you know, I follow a very prudent process, but like anyone, sometimes you like to go, oh, you know, I just, I just think I want to put some money in this. And so I had a friend who had done what I thought was a lot of due diligence on a penny stock. And, you know, it was going to, if I remember correctly, it was going to, you know, create some kind of a centralized database for law enforcement versus it was all dispersed, right? No state's <laughs> databases talk to each other. So it was some kind of technology around that. And I thought, well, this sounds like a great idea. And he's done all his research. And so I put in, I believe it was about $11,000, which for me at the time was, you know, too much. That's yeah. the honest truth. It was too much of, of my portfolio. And of course, that penny stock ended up, you know, I don't think it went to zero, but maybe I got $1,000 out, you know, 
five years later when I finally said, oh, this isn't actually going anywhere. So, you know, what did I do? Well, I didn't follow my own rules. (laughs) I mean, it's okay to put some money in a penny stock. I probably should have put in $1,000. That would have been a prudent amount if I really thought, you know what, I think this has some potential. Um, For me at the time, it was it was too much. Yeah. I, I, as you're mentioning this, I, I'm thinking of I just had a conversation with the author of a book who, about Warren Buffett, where Warren Buffett says that his most famous mistake was actually buying Berkshire Hathaway, the name of the company. And 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 the mistake was that he overpaid for it. He got his let his emotions get the better of him, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and that he keeps the name Berkshire Hathaway to remind him of his one big investment mistake. And uh, and so even investors of his nature are prone to making mistakes, but they learn the lessons, perhaps. We're all prone to making mistakes. And we talk about that, you know, here with our planners around watching out for our own biases. So we talk about behavioral biases contributing to investing mistakes, things like overconfidence or recency bias. And so we have to be highly aware as advisors that we can be subject to these biases and and make mistakes as easily as anyone else. Now, for me, there's things I've done with my own money that I would never recommend a client do. You know, my penny stock is one example. Um, There's two other what I call big mistakes that I made One, wasn't the underlying investment. So you and I did a video, gosh, two years ago now on cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And in that video, I I love the technology. I'm very excited about what it can do. I still am. And I talked about investing 1% of your portfolio, right? 1%, very prudent amount. Now, I invested more than 1%, and the actual cryptocurrency I bought has done just fine. It's actually significantly more than than what I paid for it. But what I underestimated was the custodial relationship, and I held my funds at BlockFi, which is a custodian that filed bankruptcy. So my funds are now tied up in bankruptcy. I don't know if or when I will get them back or how much I will get back. So it's interesting because the underlying investment I made – has done just fine, but I can't access it and I don't know what I'll get back because I missed a key risk. I was aware of the risk. I, in my mind, deminimized that risk. I thought, well, that situation's not really going to happen. And, you know, that custodian's not going to run into those kinds of troubles, but it did. And so my my funds got got tied up. And so that's what I call sometimes we, you know, we just miss a key risk or we in our head, we don't realize what would be the magnitude of that risk be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see this with clients that have too much money in a single stock, and they simply won't part with it. Many, many years ago, I remember a a woman at a CPA firm I worked with, and she had over $10 million in Intel stock, would not part with it. And it's not understanding, and that stock did go down by well over 50%. I believe her $10 million went to about $3 million. And, you know, it's not understanding the magnitude of that risk. Like, you know, what is it going to do for your life if that stock goes up another, you know, let's say it doubles again, versus what's that going to do to your life if the stock goes down 80%? So you really have to weigh that out. So it's not just in the investments that you put money in, but it's also in what you don't get out of, right? In her case, it was concentrated stock. And if she had exited out of it, she would have, you know, had an incredible lifestyle, and uh, as it ended up being, she's still going to be okay with three million, but that's not nearly the lifestyle that that ten million dollar portfolio would have provided for her. Yeah, about two thirds less than it would have been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, any other mistakes that you've made that are worth noting, or? Yeah, there's one. There's one more significant investment mistake. So. You know, this was a few years ago. I'm a part of a group of women who do real estate investing, and I really joined to learn more about um, investing outside of what is, you know, our normal realm. We use index funds and very publicly traded, diversified, transparent portfolios. They, this group does a lot of, you know, private real estate investing, whether it be rental properties or hard money lending. And one of the girls and her husband, 
um, girls, women, let me use the right word, grown women. <laughs> so one of them and, and her husband uh, had bought some property and had this fabulous idea, and they had experience doing this, to build a, an RV park. It was on a lake, and you know you would come up and have these kind of condos where you would dock your RV and, and have this lakefront place. And of course, the RV business is booming. 60, what is it, 12,000 people a day turning 65. So that, that business is, is, I just talked to a client the other day, a two-year wait list for the RV they want. Wow. So everything checked off. They had the experience, the partners, the pro forma, looking at the financial returns. And I thought, yeah, you know, I would like to invest with her. And, and so I did, a, it was a private placement within my Roth IRA. You have to open a self-directed IRA. And what happened is their contracting partner got COVID and died. Now, his contributions to the project was the contracting expertise. So now they didn't have a contractor. In order to find one, they needed to pay one versus before, I believe, that person was going to contribute their human capital. Mm. And they didn't have life insurance on that key person. And so they had to sell the project. Now, it it they did a fabulous job actually of marketing it. And, and we ended up getting about 66 cents back on the dollar, but still that was one of those. It was an opaque investment. The actual project was solid, which is why it was saleable in the end. People had the right expertise. They'd done it before. You know, I would have had to have a very thorough due diligence process to go down and start asking questions like, do you have key man insurance? on your contractor. Yeah. That would have been the question that, that would have been asked. And maybe if someone had asked it, they would have gotten the insurance. You never know. Uh, but I didn't ask. And so, you know, it checked all the boxes. But again, uh, I missed a key risk. Yeah. So it goes back to also this notion of you can do all the due diligence, but if you don't know the right questions to ask either, it becomes problematic too, right? You're, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, and, you know, I didn't think to ask. And when I think about all of these things, I, you know, I kind of kick myself in the butt because the majority of my money, all my retirement money, is invested exactly the way we invest clients' money. And that has done just fine. And so I sit there and I go, Dana, like, you don't have a great track record with doing things outside of this. Why do you even do it? And, yeah. you know, my nature as an entrepreneur is a risk taker. And so understanding that nature more and more can help me say, you know what, that may be your nature, but just know, just, yeah. you know, put your money the same way your client and don't do these things that sound so shiny. They sound so shiny, right? That we get emotionally sucked in. It's like, oh yeah, this is going to do this and it's going to be so cool. And uh, we miss those key risks or we violate, you know, policies around what is a prudent amount to put in. Yeah. So as you're talking, then I'm reminded of um, some of the work I do at the street was uh, many a few years ago with Jim Cramer, and he's often criticized for his show Mad Money. But when you talk to Jim Cramer about how he invests money and how he thinks people should invest money, he says for your invest for your retirement funds, I don't want you investing the way I'm talking about on Mad Money. Mad Money is money you can afford to lose, not money that you should be setting aside to pay for expenses in retirement. And so. You know, when I think about what we're talking about here is if you have uh, a por portion of your portfolio for mad money, for money you can afford to lose, and it represents a small portion of your portfolio, well, maybe you can afford to take those risks. <laughs> or, uh, but if you're, if you're not viewing it that way, maybe you shouldn't take those risks. I agree 100%. I'd love to see those kind of disclaimers, not only on his show, but on, you know, other types of advice that are kind of spouting off these, these more risky strategies. You know, it's interesting because we have a lot of clients who will keep the bulk of their portfolio, you know, with us, but we'll keep a, they call it their play account. And sometimes we'll even tag it, you know, their play mm -hmm. account. And so, and they will tell us like, that's going to keep me out of the rest of my money. <laughs> We've had someone say, several people say that to us. Like if I can just have this little pot over here that I can, you know, play around with the stock or, you know, write covered calls or whatever it is that they like to do, that will keep me from 
risking the, the bulk of my assets. And I think that can be a great strategy for people like me who tend to, you know, want to take risks. It's like, great, I can take the, those risks with this little pot. If I lose it all, I'm done. Um, but, you know, the rest of the money needs to be in something that's, that's, you know, far more appropriately invested with, you know, more predictable outcomes over long periods of time. Yeah. And the other thing that our discussion, at least for me, yields is this notion around a better understanding of risk. People like uh, Anna Marie Lusardi from George Washington or Olivia Mitchell from University of Pennsylvania, they talk about how how um, how little people know about risk and probabilities and, and the importance that that plays in terms of becoming a better investor. Uh, Curious for your thoughts. You know, I love that. I was talking with a, a client's son who just graduated from from high school. And so they wanted to gift him a small amount of money and have him start to learn how to invest. So one of the things we went through was risk return trade-offs. And I went through what I call my risk scale one to five. So a level one risk, I tell people, what's the most important question you can ask? Can I lose all my money? Now, if I would have asked that about the private emplacement and investment into the RV park I did, the answer is, yeah, I can. Um, crypto, yeah, I can lose all my money. And I, and I was aware of that in these cases. So I understood the risk. Um, when I think about the clients who invested you know, their entire portfolio on a promissory note, did they ask that question? Can I lose all my money? If they had asked and said, well, yeah, I could, would that have caused them pause to say, hmm, I probably shouldn't put all my money in this? And, and same with the client that put all their money in the mortgages limited, you know, private lending strategy instead of just 10 percent. If he had asked himself, can I lose all my money doing this? And, 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 and would that have kind of been that wake up call to yeah. say, oh, wait a second. So I, I think that's really important. And, and when the answer is no, we call that a risk level one. Right. Can I lose all my money? No risk level one. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have people say, you know, can I lose well, can I lose all my money is one. Can I actually that's that's on the five spectrum. I'm going backwards. Um, can I lose any money is, you know, a risk level one. So you want to say, can I lose any money? Well, in most investments, you can lose some money, right? If you sell at the wrong time. So when you're talking about a risk level one, that would be, can I lose any money in a savings account, bank savings account under FDIC insurance limits, right? That would be what I call a risk level one. So now I've got my scale going the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> and then up to that five is, can I lose all my money? Well, I asked this young man, you know, well, think about Tesla stock. Could you lose all your money? He thought about it and he's like, well, yeah, you know, theoretically I could. And I said, exactly. So that's a risk level five, right? That's, um, yeah. you know, and so the question is, do you want any of your money at that level of risk? And if we want to shift that from a risk level five down to a four, where your portfolio could certainly go up and down in value, like we could invest in an index fund, very diversified that owns 2000 publicly traded stocks. And I could be talking to you in three months and it could be down 30%. It's mm -hmm. happened in the past. But if you're willing to hold it over long periods of time, it's it's unlikely that it's going to permanently lose money, right? It's it's historically much more likely that it's going to recover its value. And so I was able to explain that difference between that risk level five and then scaling back to a risk level four. And what does that really look like? So yeah, those could be just two key questions that you could ask. Can I lose all my money? Can I lose any money? Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in uh, almost 30 minutes, Dana. <laughs> Holy cow. I was think that was that was longer than perhaps we expected, but it's it's good stuff that people it's really should stuff. think about. Yeah, so I I'm I'm going to guess that there's nothing that we missed, but there might be something worth reemphasizing. Following a, a plan, having a set of guidelines, and if you're like me and you, you know, like to go for those shiny things, it's really saying, okay, what is a prudent amount that I would allow myself to kind of get that side of me, you know, have let 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 that side of me have a little fun and adventure, and how do I do that with a small amount to protect? 
the rest of my wealth so that it's there for me in retirement. 